Well, thank you, Mary. And now I'm going to uh, go ahead and talk about recovery in patients treated with uh, stem cell transplants. So here are my disclosures. So when we think about hematopoietic cell transplantation, of course, what are we trying to do for our patients? Um, well, we want them to be alive and free of the disease for which we did the transplant. We'd ideally like to restore their life expectancy back to normal as if they did not have their disease or the transplant. And we want them to have normal physical and mental functioning and good quality of life. And then relevant to this discussion, of course, we want them to return to social roles, such as the parent, worker, and student. So unfortunately, uh, we're not able to uh, return them to normal life expectancy. Um, increased mortality rates persist after transplant. Um, and these are some data from Fred Hutchinson in which Paul Martin looked at patients who were five years after their transplants, who were disease-free, so they were cured of the underlying disease. But you can see that even up to 30 years after transplantation, their mortality rate is much higher than an age and sex match general population. In fact, it's four to nine times higher uh, than the age and sex matched um, population. And this translates into about a 30% decrease in life expectancy. And if you look at two-year disease-free survival um, and you're having, you had an autologous transplant, your 10-year survival is only 70 to 80%. If you're an allogeneic transplant survivor, your 10-year survival is about 85% and it falls to 80% after 15 years. And this has been documented in multiple studies. And what are those causes of late death? So again, this is back to the five-year disease-free survivors. And you can see that cancer, so either recurrent disease or second cancers, is still a major cause of death, both in the allogeneic and the autologous survivors. But there's also an increase in cardiovascular um, uh, causes, infection, chronic graft versus host disease. And so what about normal physical and mental functioning and good quality of life? Well, I think it's important to realize that many people are already disabled before transplant. This is because as we heard, most transplants will perform for hematologic malignancies. And these patients get cyclic pre-transplant chemo and radiotherapy. And in fact, many people are unable or not advised to work or go to school even before they come to the transplant center. These patients have high rates of comorbidities, frailty, poor, uh, poor physical and mental quality of life. And this can correlate with complications, transplant rate of mortality and survival. And also I wanna point out that unlike some other life-saving medical procedures, maybe heart and lung transplants, hematopoietic cell transplantation does not usually improve health or curing disease. So these are some data showing the pre-transplant comorbidities, frailty and quality of life and how these predict survival in our patients. On the left, you see something called the hematopoietic cell transplant comorbidity index. This is a measure of comorbidities that the patients have before transplant. You can see that many of our patients have high comorbidities, and this is associated with poor overall survival. In the middle panel, we're looking at a combination of instrumental activities of daily living and the comorbidity index, showing again that some patients are pretty compromised and have poor survival. And on the far right, I'm showing you some data from a cooperative study showing that, that pre-transplant patient-reported outcomes also correlate with subsequent survival. So that's before transplant. If we think about the time after transplant, with day zero being the point at which the stem cells are infused, you can see that attributable disability um, can, and can be assigned to many different things. Of course, there are all those pre-transplant comorbidities that, that uh, I talked about. But also relapse is of course a very high um, uh, risk for these patients and particularly high in the first two years but does persist for many years afterwards. Transplant long-term effects are things that start during the transplant and then persist. And transplant late effects are things that come up later but are due to the transplant. And then of course there's the whole getting older thing on top of all of these other risk factors. And so I'm gonna divide my subsequent remarks into sort of this day zero to two years and then further down the line. So if we think about the first one to two years after transplant, what really is gonna determine if our patient is disabled? Well, the main thing is how the transplant goes, the toll it takes on the patient. Are these temporary or permanent comorbidities? And how the patient recovers from these challenges. Uh, also, whether relapse occurs or for patients who get allogeneic procedures or their chronic GVHD develops. 
So there aren't very many studies about the actual trajectory um, following patients from all the way before transplant through transplant, but I'll show you some of the studies. These are some data from the cooperative uh, group study that I showed you before um, that looked at trajectories within the first uh, six months after transplant. And I wanna make some points. Uh, on the left are the, is the physical component scale. So this is from the SF36. And you can see that three fourths of the patients in that class one actually had poor uh, health even before transplant. And that persisted for the first um, six months after transplant. Only 18% were sort of uh, average and stable and 5% started average and then probably had a tough transplant and declined. On the right, you see that the mental component scale, so mental functioning, actually is not as bad as physical functioning in our patients, uh, with many patients having good and stable or actually even improving mental status, uh, a good proportion having average or stable, and then fewer having poor and stable uh, as a pattern. Um, if we look at that toll that the transplant takes, so just the quality of life comparing before transplant to 100 days afterwards, we see that changes in physical and mental functioning do predict survival. And these are some data from a cooperative group study. Um, but when you compare changes in the physical component scale and the mental component scale from before transplant to 100 days, you can see that changes are associated with overall survival and transplant related mortality. And this is adjusting for all of our uh, medical uh, factors such as age, baseline score, and various risk and disease um, status. Here, I'm just showing you this graphically with the physical functioning changes on the left and the mental functioning changes on the right. Uh, in this study, 27% of patients died after day 100 at a median of eight months. And you can see that in terms of physical functioning, those who had a decline in their physical functioning had much higher mortality. In fact, their survival was only 50% at two years. Interestingly, the same thing happened with mental functioning. With patients who had uh, mental functioning worsening, or even those who were stable, having relatively poor survival. What about patients who make it out to one year? These are some older data, but I'm showing you the medication burden at one year for 118 um, allogeneic survivors. You can see that the burden is high even at one year post-transplant. These patients had a median, were on a median of six systemic medications, and you can see the breakdown there. Many were still on prophylactic antibiotics, they were on immunosuppression, antihypertensive, bifosinates, antidepressants, diabetes medication. And in fact, 71% of these patients were still on immunosuppression at one year, which is important because that's one of the determinants as we think about whether patients are safe to go back to work. Now I'm gonna show you some data for some of these longitudinal studies, which focus on um, quality of life and return to function after one year. These are some data from Fred Hutch. Um, Karen Savalia will be giving one of the talks later on, but she studied 319 patients before transplant, and in fact, was still following 94, 94 of them at five years. This is primarily an allogeneic population. You can see on the figure at the left that there was a very high burden of physical limitations even before transplant, that it peaked at day 90. It was better at one year, but it was still very um, profound at three and five years post-transplant, and that it was worse in the patients who had depression before transplant. On the right, I'm showing you return to full-time work um, with the men in the southern lines and the women in the dotted lines. Um, the bottom uh, curves are the cumulative incidence of return to work, and the top curve is the, um, the patients who died or relapsed. You can see that, again, the return to work is not bad. In fact, almost all the men return to work, women a little bit less likely, um, but that it took quite a long time. In fact, by one year, only about 50% of people were back at work. These are some other data that are older now, um, but again, followed patients before transplant, so 320 patients, and then surveyed them at six months, one year, and two years. You can see that the response rate was very high at six months, one year, and two years, um, and that it was half an auto population and half an allogeneic population. I'll point out that like many of these studies, there was a very high percentage of white and college educated uh, patients. Um, as I mentioned, re the uh, return was um, pretty high. I'll also note that not returning a survey was associated with relapse or death. And in fact, about 50% of people who did not return a survey subsequently relapsed or died in the next six months. I'd also like to mention that about some of the, some of the two year participants were converted to another study. And so that will explain some of the results um, that I'm gonna show you in subsequent slide. 
So in this study, we actually asked patients how they were recovering. And so we asked them, um, how much do you agree with the statement? I have recovered from my transplant. And you can see that for the autos and for the allos, we surveyed them at 6, 12, and 24 months. Um, and I'm showing you here the patients who had a deceased in the black bar, patients who were alive but did not endorse a good outcome in the red bar, those patients who were alive with a good outcome in the yellow bars, and then those who did not return the survey in the blue bars, sort of as a, sen as a sensitivity analysis, but as I've told you, many of those patients had poor health. I can see in this slide that the autos are much more likely to say that they have recovered from their transplant at six months, but actually by 12 months and 24 months, the auto and allo population are pretty similar, and they sort of top out at about 70% saying that they have recovered. We asked them if they were back to school, work, and homemaking. And again, you can see that the autos are recovering a little bit faster than the allos, um, but that at 12 and 24 months, they actually look more similar than different and they're sort of topping out at about 70%. So when we ask our myeloblade of allogenic patients how they're doing, this is what they tell us. At six months, 43% have very good or excellent health, but 44% are bothered a lot or extremely bothered by fatigue and 41% say they've recovered from their transplant. At 12 months, the numbers are a little bit better. 58% have very good or excellent health. 35% are bothered a lot or extremely bothered by fatigue. 66% have recovered from their transplant. Uh, but 58% are back at school work and homemaking and 67% by 24 months. The autologous patients actually tell us almost the same thing. At six months, 37% have very good or excellent health but 42% are bothered a lot or extremely bothered by fatigue, and only 55% have recovered from their transplant. At 12 months, 46% have very good or excellent health, 30% are bothered a lot or extremely bothered by fatigue, 65% have recovered by, from their transplant, but 61% are back at school, work, or homemaking, and 70% by 24 months. And these patients face a lot of late effects. This is just a, a non-exhaustive list. Multiple people have written and published on these rates and you'll hear more about them, but the burden of comorbidities and late effects is very, very high in our population. And it continues to increase with time. These are some data from the bone marrow transplant survivor study showing that the rate of grade three to five uh, chronic health conditions in both the autos and allos continue to increase with time. And in this study, they had some controls. They looked at the siblings and they were able to say that the rate of grade three and four complications was three times the rate in the healthy siblings. Um, frailty is, is getting a lot uh, more interest in our population. Um, frailty is basically premature aging, it's decreased physiologic reserve, and uh, these patients are more susceptible to stressors. It's characterized by five things which we see a lot in our patients, exhaustion, weakness, slow walking speed, low physical activity, and unintentional weight loss. And it's associated with more chronic health conditions and higher mortality in pretty much every population, including the general population in which this has been evaluated. When we look at our patients before transplant, which is in the top two bars, we see that the rate of frailty is actually pretty high. The first one is, is from the University of Minnesota, and they looked at patients who were more than 40 years old at the time of transplant, and they found a 21% frailty rate. In another study from the University of Chicago that looked at patients who were more than 50 pre-transplant, the rate was 25% of frailty. And when you look after transplant, it's shown in the bottom two bars, you can see that the frailty rate is pretty high, considering that in the general population, the frailty rate of people over 65 is between seven and 10%. Therefore, when you see an 8.4% rate of frailty in patients who are eight years post-transplant, you can see how compromised our, our post-transplant survivors are. This is in comparison to a rate of about 0.7% in the siblings. When you looked at patients who were more than 10 years post-pediatric uh, transplant, so these are patients who were transplanted at children's, as children, the frailty rate was 7% compared to 1.6% in patients who had gotten conventional chemotherapy. And just as with other populations, frailty is associated with higher mortality. These are, are some data from the bone marrow transplant survivor study showing that 8.4% of patients were frail 
And interestingly, they were mostly frail by the definition of exhaustion, slowness, and weakness. It was more of this than the low physical activity and the weight loss. The predictors of fra frailty in this study were multiple myeloma, allogeneic survivors who had chronic graft-versus-host disease, those patients who had chronic health conditions, and interestingly, low socioeconomic status. But the 10-year mortality rate for the frail population was 39% compared to 15% in the patients who were not frail. And that was highly statistically significant. So successful hematopoietic cell transplantation also involves returning to social roles as a parent, worker, and student. And across multiple studies and in different populations with different study designs, we find that only 50 to 80% of our transplant survivors return to full and part-time work. The predictors of not returning to work include things like patient factors, so women, those who have lower educational status or who are older, patients who have symptoms, so fatigue, pain, and cognitive dysfunction, which is very common in our population, those who have comorbidities, so the HTTCI that I showed you and number of hospitalizations, and those that have medical, medical complications that are associated with transplant. So grade three to four acute graft versus host disease, relapse and chronic GVHD. Transplant variables can also be associated. So things like total body irradiation. Rachel Sallett did a survey of transplant programs and she achieved about a 30% response rate to her survey. So 45 transplant programs responded. 100% of these programs recommended a return to work of less than six months for autologous survivors. However, for, for allogeneic survivors, most transplant programs are recommending between four and more than 12 months. And often this depends on the type of job and whether the patients are in immunosuppression. And 35% of programs recommended gradual return to work because often we find that our patients try to go back to work and they're just not able to do that and then have to either quit their job or decrease hours or go on disability. What about return to school? Well, Neil Bott did this survey of transplant, of pediatric transplant programs. It was primarily focused on COVID, but he also asked about before COVID. You can see that about half of pediatric programs are suggesting that their students, that their uh, children can go back to school less than one year. But for the other half, they take into account things like um, whether their patients are in immunosuppression or even recommend going back to school more than one year after transplant. So our patients face many causes of disability. There's physical uh, things such as lack of strength and stamina, mental dysfunction, so depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder, cognitive dysfunction, things like um, deficits in executive function and memory. They have a lot of symptoms of fatigue and pain, all of the comorbidities, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary dysfunction, diabetes, bone health. Also the ongoing risk of infections, which we'll hear about. Our patients are highly immunosuppressed whether due to chronic graft versus host disease or medications or maintenance therapy. And of course, with COVID, we're in a whole new world. Our patients have frequent need for medical care, lots of clinic visits. They can be hospitalized and there's absenteeism. And I'll point out that many of our post-transplant disabilities are not extremely visible to the public, nor are they self-limited. I was asked to talk about trends in transplant and the implications for disability. What we're finding is you've heard that older and sicker patients can undergo transplant. And more studies are showing a survival benefit with transplant over non-transplant therapies in many populations, including the older populations. It's unclear whether these gentler transplant approaches that you hear about and better supportive care will result in actually better overall health for our transplant survivor population or more people surviving in poor health. So in summary, um, many people are already disabled before transplant. I've shown you that our autologous survivors recover earlier and they do have fewer late effects than allos, but their reported health actually looks more similar than different at one year, um, except for chronic graft versus host disease, which only applies to our allogeneic survivors. There's a high burden of comorbidities, ongoing medical care and compromised function and quality of life. And this does improve with time, but it plateaus about 70 to 80% recovery. And this is based on most, multiple facets. So as I've shown you, uh, life expectancy only goes back to about 70 or 80%. Work only goes back to about 70 or 80%, and even patient-reported outcomes. Most disabilities are not visible or self-limited. 
and only 50 to 80% of people return to full-time or part-time work after transplant. I think rates of post-transplant disability burden are going to rise as we transplant more and sicker patients, and including if we start to man, uh, do other manipulations after transplant, so things like uh, maintenance therapies. And so thank you for your attention, and I apologize for my slide bumble at the beginning. I think we're happy to take any questions.